On Sunday nights, we are discussing the book of Revelation and the book of Ezekiel. Sunday mornings, we're in the book of Daniel and Nehemiah. And you cannot understand the Bible without understanding something about the culture of the day. You just can't come up and say, well, it says here, and, and that's what we think it means. And I've had people say, well, we're speaking English. We can't speak uh, uh, Greek and 2,000 years ago. It's whatever it means today. No, it does not mean what it means today. You have to go back, take the culture back in the ancient world. You have to know their, their, uh, they have to know the nation. You have to know that they were ruled by the Greek, by the Romans. You have to know that the Romans were barbarians and they were over here slaughtering Jews. The Jews was a, it's a little bitty nation. It was like a needle. It was like a thorn in the side of the Romans. Man, they, they bothered the Romans and the Romans would come in and kill the Jews just at the snap of a finger. They didn't care about the Jews. Pilate offered them up on altars up in Galilee and he would go in and kill them just uh, without very little cause. And you have to understand what their, uh, what their vocations were. And uh, we've talked about shepherding and hunting and, and farming and the grain and the problems they had with the grain, the problems the shepherds had and how they built uh, their folds. And we talked about uh, uh, just all sorts of vocations from being a potter to working in metals. And we've talked about various uh, uh, instruments of war they used. And tonight, I want to talk something about the cities and how that they built them. I, what I'm doing is giving you a little, uh, I'm giving you a little bit of culture at the first, before I go into the book of Revelation on Sunday night, and I'm giving you a little culture about, on Wednesday night, the, about these books. I've got a, I got a book here, one of the easiest books to read, Manners and Customs of Bible Lands, and I've been meaning to get into another book. This is by Fred White, and this is a book right here that Marcella got for me. It's Paul's Metaphors by David Williams. This is really good. I'm going to tie these two together tonight to show you something about, uh, about Oriental towns and cities and life in their cities. And if you don't know how they built their uh, houses and how they built their buildings, we always think of when we look at, uh, uh, we see a movie with, Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton and Cleopatra out of the 60s and everything is built with these great big stone structures but that's not true they, they built things out of wood and when Paul talks about having foundations uh, built on uh, stone well most of them didn't build their foundations that way and those people back in that day would know exactly what Paul meant when he said something like this but let me read a little out of this out of this book, Matters and Customs of a Bible Lands, it's on the oriental town or city. And it's talking about the walls of the city here. Uh, the difference between the city and the village as to walls. In early Old Testament times, the villages were smaller places of abode without walls around them. Uh, whereas the cities or towns were larger places that had walls around them. The Mosaic Law made such a distinction if a man sell a dwelling house in a walled city there in Leviticus 25, 29. And on Sunday morning, we're talking about the walls of Jerusalem being torn down when Nebuchadnezzar carried him to captivity and how Nehemiah went back to rebuild the city in the wall. And he says, uh, Leviticus 25, 29, but the houses of the villages which have no wall round about them in Leviticus 25, 31, the villages were often located near a fortified city upon which they were more or less dependent. Thus, the city was the metropolis of the village. Now, the word metropolis, M-E-T-R-O-P-O-L-I-S, that's a Greek word. It comes from meter or mater, uh, which is the word mother. And the word polis, which is the word people. It means mother of the people. That's why we, we always call cities she. Thus, or we give a feminine gender to it. Thus, the city was the metropolis of the villages 
or the mother of the villages. In any time, she was called the mother of the villages. And when you're reading along in the Bible, and it says the daughters, the daughters of Israel, what that's talking about are the villages of Israel. Because the mother was the main metropolis and the surrounding villages were called uh, the daughters. Uh, and so whenever you're reading something, you're reading in Isaiah and it'll talk about the daughters of, of Israel. It's talking about the little villages around the big city. Thus the city was the metropolis of the villages. We often read in the Bible of cities and their villages. And sometimes a literal translation will be given us the expression cities and their daughters indicating a mother city and her independent and her dependent villages surrounding her there and you can look at that in Joshua 1545 and in 1711 and all through the scriptures the walls were a part of city fortifications it fortified the city now you remember we've talked about Babylon and Babylon was a Babylon had these great high walls and had a moat around Babylon and the moat they had these walls that were were uh, uh, around 390 feet tall and the moat was another 380 or 90 feet deep so you had from bottom of the moat to the top of the wall 800 feet and but the walls they didn't just simply build a wall They would build sometimes an eight-foot wall and then another eight-foot wall within that. And that way, if the people that were attacking the city got over the one wall, they'd have to come down into this area down here. Sometimes they'd have double and triple walls, and you get caught down there in the bottom in between these two walls, and you were just uh, easy pickings for their guys with their slings and their bows and arrows and their stones that they'd throw down on you. So it wasn't easy especially to take something like Babylon. And that's why when Babylon said we can't be destroyed, that's why Cyrus blocked up the river and came down the riverbed to, and he marched into the city because the city straddled the river. And that was the weak point. When somebody thinks they don't have a weak point, they always do. Now, the, the speaking of the city, the walls were part of city fortifications. In Bible times, most cities were walled and fortified for protection against an enemy. Those living in a city without walls would be interested in having walls built for them. And the Bible says we live in a city without walls. We live in a Jerusalem without walls because Christ is a wall of fire about us. And, and our walls are salvation according to the 26th chapter of Isaiah. So when the Bible speaks of walls, it has much to it, there's much meaning behind it. Often when the Bible says that a certain character built a city, what is meant is not that a new site was located and a new city was built, but rather a city already inhabited was supplied with walls entirely around its confines. It was thus that Solomon built Beth Horon, the upper, and Beth Horon, the nether, fence cities, with walls, gates, and bars. So it was said they were building a city when they would simply fortify them with walls. And you find that in Second Chronicles 8 and 5. Let me read to you something out of this Paul's Metaphors. And without underst- I like this book here. This I really thank Marcella for this because this has really got some wonderful things in it. Uh, and his first chapter is Life in the City. Uh, no century before the 20th, has been more urban in character than the first. Certainly in the Mediterranean world of the first century, the world of Rome and its empires, the city was dominant. The Romans, it is said, did not feel at home in the country. Now, we feel at home in the country, but our country, we're out in the country, we're safe. They were not safe out in the country. To feel at home, they needed a city. And in this regard, Paul was a child of his time. He was preeminently a man of the city, a citizen of Rome, born in Tarsus itself, no ordinary city in Acts 21 and 39. 
and a missionary to most of the great urban centers of the world. Now, the first thing he says, uh, he brings out the first uh, illustration, is the threat of the city. He'll tell you the problems they had inside the city. The city was no place for the timid. Forty years after Paul met his end in Rome, Juvenal, that's one of the historians, he lived from 50 to 127 of the Christian era or the common era, whichever you want to call it, described that city, uh, speaking of Rome, Juvenal described that city as a grim, hostile, dangerous place. Rome was no exception in this regard. Paul arrived in Corinth as perhaps in other cities on his itinerary in, quote, fear and with much trembling in 1 Corinthians 2, 3. There was probably a spiritual dimension to this trepidation. I believe there was. I don't believe it's just because he's afraid of the city. But there were also practical reasons for feeling afraid of the city, any city in that day and time. It is true that Corinth had a particularly bad reputation. I read in one of my books years ago that if you called a man a Corinthian, you better be ready for a fight. Because to call a man a Corinthian was the worst cuss word you could call him. Uh, they were just wildest, meanest, most ornery snakes in that town. And uh, Corinth had a particularly bad reputation, which may or may not have been deserved. To some extent, it was probably a hangover from Semir past. There is also a suspicion that Athenian propaganda had something to do with it. The fruits of commerce are often envied by those who are devoted to culture. Nevertheless, Corinth was a rip-roaring town and which, so Horace says, in 65 to 68 BCE, that means before the common era, it's also called Christian era, before the Christian era, or before Christ. When you see, when you see BCE... It means before the common era or before the Christian era. Some people don't realize it's also called before Christian era. Or we would just say B.C. Or if you see C.E., that means the common era or the Christian era or after, after A.D. in the year of our Lord, after Christ. A.D. does not stand for after his death. It's Anno Domini, and it means in the year of our Lord. So... When he was born, uh, one second after Jesus born was 1 A.D. It was one in the year of our Lord. None but the tough could survive. Whew, that's a word, isn't it? None but the tough in Corinth could survive. And yet the Corinth that Paul knew was probably no worse than any other city at that time. All cities were dangerous places and then the, and in them all fear was endemic. Now, I'm going to get to you later on the squalor of the city. We're going to talk about the refuse of the city and how they got rid of the, the garbage and the trash, fires in the city. And we're going to go into the foundations of the different cities. But I'm going to read to you a little bit about darkness and light, the way they looked at it in the first century. Now, when Paul said, you were darkness, but now are you light? That had specific meaning to the people in the first century. When, he, when Jesus says, you are the light of the world, those are not just flowery, nice, pretty words. Those had an exact meaning. The night especially was a time to be afraid. As dusk fell, the city shut down, and anyone who ventured out after closing was at risk. Juvenile laments that to go out to supper in Rome without having first made your will was to be guilty of an act of gross negligence. You better be ready when you go out after dark. It was called, uh, among the Jews, they would call it outer darkness because at night that's where the thieves would break through and steal. The pages of the digest show how, how real and pervasive was the danger that the Romans faced from murderers and housebreakers and muggers. You remember when we talked about at the wedding, uh, if you didn't have on the wedding garment and you went from the house of the bride, 
uh, bride's house to the bridegroom's house. And here it was one o'clock in the morning. If you did not have the white wedding garment, you were cast into outer darkness. That's a picture of hell. And there were thieves and robbers out there and they didn't have street lights, and no cops were patrolling. And that and you took your life in your hands to be thrown out in the middle of the night. At night, the city's narrow streets were plunged into impenetrable darkness. That's outer darkness. That's what it's called. Little or no attempt was made at lighting them. Night fell over the city, any city, like the shadow of a great danger, and most people fled to their homes, shut themselves in and barricaded their doors, but some welcomed the night as a cloak for their deeds. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. That's what this is talking about. Paul enlists their actions, orgies, drunkenness, sexual indulgence, and debauchery as a metaphor of immoral conduct in general. The works of darkness, he calls them, darkness characterizing the children of this age and the light, the children of God. At Christ's return, he will bring to light the things cloaked by darkness. They all knew what that meant. That is, he will expose the inner thoughts of man's hearts, and you can see that in 1 Corinthians 4 and 5. We are children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness there in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 5. Christians say, Christians, says Paul, were once darkness, but now are light in the Lord, a reference to their status there in Ephesians 5 and 8, he follows with a plea concerning their practice. Walk as children of light. He also employed the thief in the night as an image of Jesus' return in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 4. He says the Lord will come as a thief in the night, but he won't come to us as a thief. We're not the children of the darkness that that day should overtake us as a thief. It was chiefly at night, of course, under the cover of darkness, that thieves did their work. But here the thought is more of the unexpectedness of Jesus' coming than of the time. Like the thief, he will come when the people least expect him. This appears to be a reminiscence of a saying of Jesus himself. Doors were commonly barred against thieves and the like. But Paul spoke of doors that were sometimes surprisingly opened when Paul and Barnabas returned to Antioch from what we call the first missionary journey. They gathered the church together and gave an account of what they had done, but they acknowledged that the achievement was not so much theirs as God's, for he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles in Acts fourteen twenty seven. The focus of attention in this verse is on the hearers and their God-given response to the gospel. With this, compare Acts 16 and 14, where God opened Lydia's heart to give heed to what Paul was saying. Elsewhere, Paul uses the same figure, with, but with reference to the preachers. Thus, in describing his work in Ephesus, he declares that a great door for effective work, and he's talking about opening the door of light to them, had opened to him in 1 Corinthians 16 and 9. Again, in 2 Corinthians 2 and 12, he says that at Troas, a door had been opened to him in the Lord. This implies by the Lord, but the sense is in the course of his work for the Lord. The same metaphor but expressed in different terms is found again in 1, Corinthians, uh, 1 Thessalonians 1 and 9 and 2 and 1 as Paul speaks of his entrance into Macedonia with the gospel in, first, in Colossians 4, 3, he asked for prayer that God would open a door for him and his colleagues in Rome that even there in the imperial city they might proclaim the mystery of Christ he wrote this letter, as far as we know, from behind a locked door in that city, a prisoner of Rome. He was not free to go in and out, but under God, no door is barred to the gospel. I'm going to come back next week and read something out of both of these 
books. They're, we're kind of going together on this. I want to read something about the squalor in the city and what they had to put up with. And I hope this is helping you because you can't understand. I don't know why people say, we don't read any other books but the Bible. That's ignorance. It's just stupidity on people's part. Now we're over here. I'm, I'm struggling with, well, I'm not struggling. I don't know exactly where to start sometimes. But let's go back over to Revelation, the first chapter. And I'm tying in the book of Ezekiel. And I'm just talking to you. I'm tying in Ezekiel with the book of Revelation. There's two books in the Old Testament that are somewhat mystical, like Revelation. You have to do a lot of defining. That is the book of Ezekiel and the book of Zechariah. Zechariah is called the small revelation. It's like a small book of Revelation. But we're talking about the seven candlesticks. And we're talking about the uh, we're talking about the seven stars in the right hand of Christ. And we've said this already, but we see this is a revelation of Jesus Christ in verse 1 to the seven churches which are in Asia. And I keep saying, I like to say that it is to the seven church. Because seven is a number that means to be complete, complete, or completed. And it has the idea of going through fiery trials. Fiery trials, going through all kinds of troubles and struggles to be completed in Christ. And it comes from the word, the word seven in the Hebrew. You go to the Hebrew because this is a Hebrew book, the book of Revelation. All the facts in it can be traced back to the Old Testament. The word seven is the word Sheba. And it comes from a word that's spelled exactly the same, uh, spelled near the, to that, Shaba. And Shaba comes from the exact same root as Sheba. And Shaba means to take an oath. Take an oath or make a promise. Or make a promise. Or it means to seven oneself. To seven oneself. Or to complete oneself. And we've talked about how many times the Bible says, talking about sevens. You've got it all through Revelation. And Peter says, we're to add to our faith. And he names seven things that we're to add. Starting in Second Peter 1 and 5. Well, we see the seven churches here in verse 11 named uh, in chapter 1. Uh, and we've, we're going through these churches in chapters 2 and 3. Then we see the seven candlesticks. And the seven candlesticks comes out of the book of Exodus. That's Jewishness. In verse 12 and 13, then we see seven stars in the right hand of Christ in verse 16. And these seven stars was the Pleiades. And Jesus, and the Bible says in 22nd chapter of Revelation, Jesus is the morning star, and the morning star was the Pleiades. So when you say seven stars, anytime you see it, if it's in Amos the fifth chapter, seek him that maketh the seven stars and Orion. Or if you see there in the 38th chapter of Job, the Lord tells Job, can you bind the sweet influences of Pleiades? He could have said, can you bind the seven stars? Because the seven stars are the Pleiades were said to bring out crops in the spring and bring the covenant or the promise of God to his people when they were obedient to him. And those are the promises of God. It's what the seven stars produce when he comes to Abraham. And he says, Abraham, if you're obedient to me, I'll fill up your basket and your store and your fields. And that will come from the seven stars. It was said that the Pleiades caused Israel to have the fruits. Then he says, the mystery of the seven stars in verse 20, which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the seven angels. Of course, angel, angelos, A-G-G-E-L-O-S, means messenger. Messenger, all of the preachers in the first century, well, they're just like today, they're called messengers, but the word back then was angelos. So all preachers, anyone carrying a message, is an angel. I had a fellow come up to me in a church when I used to hold revivals around the country, and he thought I was this wonderful preacher or something. He didn't really know what a sinner I was. And he said, are you an angel, Jim? 
And, of course, I didn't know back then. I just said, no. If I'd have known, I could have said, yes, I am. I'm, I'm a messenger of God. Now, and, of course, he says the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. I keep saying the angels is a picture. It's, the angel is the word messenger. Messenger comes from message. The message is the picture. The angels is a picture of the oil in, each, in the candlesticks. It's one lamp, seven arms, and the, the angel or the message is the oil in the candlesticks. The container is the church. That's you and I. This is a picture of the Word of God written in our hearts. What's in a man's heart comes out of his mouth. That's what it's a picture of. This is allegory. It is figurative language. If men don't understand that, and I believe that I believe a true believer can understand that, even if it don't matter if he's been to the third grade, he can understand that, and an unbeliever cannot understand this this figurative language if he's got five doctor's degrees. I know men that that are very well educated. They're going, I don't know what you're talking about, Jim. And what is it, why is it a man with all this education cannot understand? And why is it that a man with a fourth grade education can understand? What is it that keeps the other man from understanding? Huh? It's his pride. That's all it is. He won't say, well, I'm so intelligent. You, you can't tell me anything. And his pride will not let him humble his heart enough to actually understand the Word of God because they think when you're talking to them, that's you and your opinion, and they've got more education than you, and you can't tell them anything. That's what men think. Now, we're talking about equating, equating the candlesticks. Don't want to go through the whole thing, but we're talking about equating the candlesticks with the chariot wheels that come in and devastate J Judah and Jerusalem in beginning in the first chapter of Ezekiel. But we find there are, in the first chapter of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 1, we find, we find uh, the four-faced beast, four-faced beast, and those four-faced beasts, they have the face of a, of, an, of a lion, the face of an ox, the face of an eagle, and the face of man. And these are called cherubim or cherubim, that's the way we pronounce it, C-H-E-R-A-B-I-M. And these cherubim, this is not something mystical. It is these... Uh, and I thought I had some here. It's these pictures that you see. Here's, here's some of them. It's these pictures. And where did the Assyrians and the Babylonians get these cherubim? It, it is these things like so where you, see the, where you see the body of a man. Or you see the head of an eagle. And here's the body of a lion. And sometimes it'll be the, the body of a bull. Oh, you've also, look, look down here. The body of a fish, the head of a man. What do you call that? What do you call that? Mermaid. Not a mermaid. A merman. A mermaid would be the woman. And where do you think that come from? Dagon. Dagon. Dog is the word fish, and that would be Dagon. And Noah was deified as the great fish god, that's actually a deification of Noah is what it is. And of course that's and and you've got all kinds of here's here's one of here's a good picture of a this was a picture of a man. Sometimes you've got pictures of uh, here's a picture of a man with the wings of the cherubim. That's one of the kings, one of the winged figures but then you've got, some of them's got the body of a man, the head of a lion, the body of a man, the head of an eagle. And you wonder, well, where did they come up with these? Here's, here they're putting up a, they're erecting, this comes out of Layard's Nineveh, they're erecting this cherubim. It's got the body of a bull and the head of a man. And they interchange these, and the pagans got a hold of this. Well, God is the first one to have this. He's the one that said, 
when Noah comes out of the ark, I'll form my covenant with the beast of the field. The, the king of beasts is the lion. Uh, with the cattle of the field, the, the king of the cattle is the ox, and with the fowl of the air. And all through Scripture, the eagle is, is connected with the king of the fowl and with man. And then he says, because I'll form that covenant, I'll put my bow in the cloud. So wherever you find the bow, of course, that's the, the we've, we keep saying this, the goddess of the rainbow was the iris, and the bow is the iris of the eye. We've said that the wheel, that the eye, the human eye, is a wheel inside of a wheel. Uh, the iris of the eye, the outer part of the iris is a stabilized part, and the inner part is this, is this retractable wheel that that opens and closes as the light comes in or as injury comes in. And God says, Israel is the apple of my eye, and apple is the word baba, and it means pupil. It means pupil. And of course, the, that what pupil is just an opening. It's just an opening, opening, and the light goes into the pupil. And of course, uh, uh, what really shocked me the first time I saw uh, in McClinic and Strong, I saw the the chariot wheels that were built back in that day and time. They were a wheel and a wheel, and they were six spokes. In the in the uh, the the war chariots were six spokes. And when you look at the the candlesticks, I believe that they were. If I, I need one made where somebody can make me, if the arms were of equal length, even though they. And they'd come out here at the same spot. When you looked at the top of it and you could see these lines, this is what you would see right here. That's what you would see. I believe that God had those pagans to make those chariot wheels to where you'd have the depiction of the candlesticks here and you'd have the bow of God's eye here. And why? And people say, how in the world can that be? I believe it is because God touched the heart of some pagan blacksmith. Now, we're talking about the chariot wheels and the destruction of Israel. And I believe this is the wheel and the wheel. Now, you've got, when we get into Ezekiel, this, this Ezekiel, the first chapter, you find these four-faced beasts, and you've, got, and you've got the wheel and the wheel there. And then, but this all started in the Genesis, the ninth chapter, and in Genesis, the ninth chapter, you've got the promise of these, of the beast of the field, the cattle, the fowl, and man. So you've got the, you've got the lion, the ox, the eagle, and man in Genesis, the ninth chapter, and you have the rainbow. But the rainbow is a wheel in a wheel. That's what it is. We've already, I, I've, I've told some of you, and Marcella went on the internet and got, pulled uh, the uh, picture of a rainbow off the internet. Mary took it off the internet. There's one that's clearer than what y'all got where it's just the colors are definite, separated. And when you look at a rainbow from an airplane or from the top of a mountain, it is a wheel inside of a wheel inside of a wheel. The rainbow is round. And there are seven colors in the rainbow... Seven colors, I always spell it with a U. That's the way it's translated in the Bible. And when, it, when the light goes into the eye and it breaks off, light is refracted. When it goes through the lens of the eye, it's refracted. It starts the refinement of colors and it's refracted into seven colors. Seven colors. And then, of course, it begins a refinement throughout the retina of the eye, the Jacob's membrane, and these hex hexagonal shaped prisms. Huh? I don't know if I've got it with me. I, I meant to bring it with me and I forgot it. Uh, but I'll bring it, I'll bring it next week. But you, wherever you find these four beasts, you've got to have the bow present because the bow is, a, and of course the bow is God's eye and when he comes back with eyes as a flame of fire, that's because he has been punched in the eye. Whoever touches Israel touches the apple of his eye. And he says that the seven candlesticks 
are the eyes of the Lord. That is abstract language, and I can't fully tell you what's going on in my mind when I say that. Can y'all grasp that at all? I can't tell you everything that's in my head when I'm trying to express to you this. I say this, and a lot of times I'll see things as I'm saying it to you. But whenever you have the rainbow, you have the wheel. And wherever you have the wheel, you've got the iris of the eye. And you also have these beasts because the beasts go with the covenant. And the covenant is the bow of God. The bow is the bow part destroys God's enemies. And the and the pupil of the eye, the pupil, those inside the pupil, the light, they are protected by God's bow. You can say in Zechariah the second chapter. When the Bible says that, that we will have a wall of fire about us, you can look at the bow of God's eye or the rainbow and you can say that this is the fire and those who are his enemies dwell here inside his bow. That's his war bow. When he comes back with eyes of the flame of fire because he's been punched in the eye, that's his war bow and we are protected so when you get in, and you've also got in Revelation, the fourth chapter and the fifth chapter, you've got these four-faced beasts, four-faced beast, and you've also got in that same picture in the second verse, you have a rainbow, and the word rainbow is the word iris. If I keep saying this to y'all love, I'm going to understand it. Have you ever studied something so hard? And I'm, if you think you've got it totally, my mind is grasping for the depth of it. If you've ever studied something, you say, I'm not getting this whole thing. Can y'all understand that at all? Huh? I am grasping at this because. And I'm seeing stuff as I teach it. So in Genesis 9, in Ezekiel 1, you've got the the chariot wheels coming in that are shaped just like the iris of the eye, and that's shaped just like the rainbow. And the word rainbow is the word iris in the Greek. It's what it is, and iris was the goddess of the rainbow. The rainbow is not just a pretty thing in the sky. The rainbow is the war bow of God. You understand that? And the war bow of God refines the colors, their destruction. Those colors are refined in a rainbow, aren't they? They're refined because they're all separated in a different circle, aren't they? When you refine something, you separate it out. Right? Well, they are all separated. They're refined. But the man that catches... The judgment of God, he's not in the pupil, he's in the bow of God, and he gets destruction, but his destruction refines us, doesn't it? So when we get to Ezekiel, the first chapter, we see the chariots, the chariot wheels coming down, and the chariots have these cherubim on the side of them, we've already discussed that. They have the cherubim on the sides of the chariot wheels. And, of course, there's the chariot wheel. It looks like the what you've got is a picture of the rainbow. You've got a picture of the iris. And you've got a picture of the candlesticks there in the middle of it. When you look at the candlesticks from the top, that's what you see. And the floral pattern of the candlesticks is a star of David. That's called the shield of David. Now, I've said this, and I hope you understand it. When you go to Ezekiel, let's go back there. When you go to Ezekiel, the first chapter, when you see these chariots or these whirlwinds coming down from the north, these are Babylonian war chariots. When you see them coming down, 
I believe those priests were so used to looking at the candlesticks and knowing what they looked like from the top. And when they were sitting around, they looked at them. They saw a six-spoke wheel. That's what they saw. If they walked up to them and looked down upon them upon the table, they saw a six-spoke wheel. It was said that David wore this menorah on a shield, and this is called Shield of David. When those chariot wheels came in, I would love to have been there when one of them pulled to a halt and one of those Babylonians said, who can I kill next? And there's a priest standing right there and he looks at that chariot wheel. I just wonder what went through his head. He went, the judgment of God is here. It must, his heart would start pounding when he saw that. Because don't you know they knew what a rainbow was? Because the Bible says, and here's and it's something else. The Bible speaks that, now I haven't, I haven't heard anybody say this, but the Bible says this. There in the fourth chapter of Revelation, here's the Ark of the Covenant. Here's the veil that you've got four cherubim around the throne of God. The throne was the Ark of the Covenant. You had two woven in the, you had two woven in the, in the uh, veil. You had one on each end of the Ark of the Covenant. And the Bible says there's a rainbow around the throne. Do you think if there's a rainbow around the throne that any of those priests ever saw that? Well, yeah, they'd have had to have seen it, wouldn't they? So if when these chariot wheels come running into Jerusalem and they recognize this star of David down here on the outer part of the sanctuary and they connect it with the rainbow... What I'm saying, this abstract thinking went through their mind and they're going, oh my God, the judgment is here. Do I believe that God made this thing up to that extent? Yes. But like I said earlier, how are you going to understand the way they think unless you go back to their culture? How? I've got a, I've got a piece of paper up here and I hadn't even read from it. And it's just about, I pulled it out of, I pulled it out of, uh, out of the uh, Kittles. It's the word rainbow and it's on iris. And I've had it in this, my stack of papers for, for weeks. And this is everything. I just underlined some stuff. The rainbow appears for the first time in Genesis 9, 13, underlying the whole idea is Perhaps the belief that the bow of the God of war or the God of thunderstorms is set in the clouds. He's not talking about just some pretty bow. They call it, out of Kittles, the bow of the war of the God of the God of uh, the belief that the bow of the God of war or the God of thunderstorms set his set his bow in the clouds. Because it is used as the way they thought is un, it's just magnificent. Uh, the common uses in the Old Testament, iris occurs only at Exodus thirty twenty four in translation, a plant used for ointment, which perhaps comes from Arabia or India. Why iris is used here is not clear. I need to go back and study that. There's perhaps some text. Wait a minute. If not, let me see. Wait a minute. The old, in the Old Testament, the rainbow is a demonstration not merely of God's grace, but also of his glory. In Ezekiel 128, comparison with it is used in describing the greatness of his glory. It bears witness with all creation to the wonderful power of the creator. It is used with the morning star and the sun to suggest the impression made by the high priest Simon. The later rabbis carried this thought further in their warning not to look at the rainbow. The rabbi said, don't look at the rainbow. Resh Lakish in 250 AD saw in this a threat to the eyesight. Since man cannot bear to look on God's glory, 
I wish I had time. Any, I just underlined some parts. The lack of assurance of salvation in later Judaism is also manifested in another way in connection with the rainbow. We often find the view that the rainbow appears only when there is none completely righteous on the earth. The word iris and its associated ideas were also indispensable to Philo. And similarly, the New Testament had to use it in order to speak intelligibly. This is the basic reason why iris is used in the ordinary sense of Greek antiquity and revelation. Let me see here. He says, but in Ezekiel 128, the bow is only a means to describe the nature and greatness of the divine doxa. I don't believe he even understands that. If then Revelation 4 and 3 speaks only of the circular radiance, he calls it a circular radiance. He knew when he wrote the Kittles dictionary that it was a circle, which is emerald green in color. Does not this imply that the reference is simply to the presence of a halo like a rainbow, not to an actual rainbow? And he speaks of the iris being around the head of Christ when he comes back. This can only be the rainbow. Uh, the iris has to be included as a traditional feature in theophonics. I don't believe they, I don't even believe a lot of them understand that all of this is connected together as it is. And I've got much more on it. The cassette. Remember the word bow that was put in the cloud is the word cassette. It means a bending. You remember when God put his bow in the cloud? He, we think of a rainbow. God put his pretty rainbow in the cloud. Right? Is that what we think? The word is cassette. Q-E-S, Q-E-S-H-E-T. The word cassette denotes the hunter's and warrior's weapon by which arrows are shot. That's what the word cassette means. It's the word bow. This comes out of the theological word book of the Old Testament. It is a hunter's bow. It's what it is. I'm reading out of, the, out of the theological word book of the Old Testament. Our word occurs 77 times. The bow, a common weapon. The cassette, a common weapon in the ancient Near East. I want you all to know I didn't make that up. It's a war bow. When God put his rainbow in the cloud, he put a circle in the cloud, a wheel in the wheel in the cloud, a war bow. He hung it up. The bow, a common weapon in the ancient Near East. I'm, when you look up, you take the word bow, you look it up in your, you look it up in your concordance, and then you take your concordance number and take that number to the theological word book, and it'll take you to the theological word book number, and when you open it up, it'll tell you all about the war bow. When you look up the bow in the cloud from Genesis 9. And this is some of the things it says about it. Jonathan used a bow or a cassette in 1 Samuel 20, 20. And later the bow became the weapon of leaders and kings. Apparently, this is the same word, the bow that Christ put in the crowds. And what he put was a circular wheel and a wheel in the cloud. That's what the rainbow is. Apparently, David's lament became a permanent part of training Israel's army. So in 2 Samuel 1:18. The enigmatic cassette may be the title or part of the title of the song so employed in 2 Samuel 1.18. By the time of Jeroboam, the bow may well have been Israel's national weapon. That was their weapon of all weapons. The more bowmen you had, you could stand back, fire them into the air, and it came down like missiles on the enemy. That's what God hung in the cloud as a sign of the covenant with the four. But how are you going to know all this if you don't look up everything in sight? I believe there's more to the rainbow than I even begin to understand yet. And I'm going to go into some, I'm going to try to study the, in fact, when you look in, in your uh, word study concordance, it'll show the first place the word cassette is mentioned is 9.13, I do set my bow in the cloud. And then the next, then the bow shall be seen in the cloud. In verse 14, the bow shall be set in the cloud. Verse 16, and then 
He gets into 2116, as it were a bow shot. Thy weapons, thy quiver and thy bow. With my sword and with my bow. His bow abode in strength, not with the sword, not with the bow. Every other time through here, it's talking about a war bow. Every other time other than, well, that's why it's a war bow here. You understand what I'm saying? It's a war bow every time. When the rainbow's put in the cloud, it's a war bow. Their main weapon in Israel. So that's what he hung up. Let's go back to Ezekiel 1. We talked about, here's the whole point of all of this. This is where I think people are missing this. And I, I've been meaning to emphasize this about the iris. Iris was the goddess of the rainbow. What if I said iris was the goddess of the war bow? Do you think maybe we need to look up iris as the goddess and find out the character? You see what I'm saying? There's so much to look up that we cannot get a hold of all of this. And I'm grasping it. As I'm teaching it to you, I'm seeing it more and more clear. That's why I don't want to quit teaching it to you. Because it keeps, it's, it, this stuff keeps coming alive. What we see in Ezekiel. Ezekiel, the first chapter. Ezekiel 1. We see, we see the, this is Ezekiel in four, or not four, around 597. He was carried away in the second deportation, second deportation of Judah into Babylon. There was one more to go, 586 B.C. The first one took place in 605 B.C. And as of this point, the kings in, in Judah were, were puppet kings. And then when, what Ezekiel is seeing is the final destruction of Jerusalem, 586. He is seeing a vision just like John is seeing visions. Well, he sees a vision of an attack from the north. Attack from the north. And he calls this whirlwinds. And we, we see that in verse 4. These are whirlwinds. And we've already said that in Isaiah 5, 28 and Jeremiah 4, 13. Jeremiah 4, 13. Jeremiah is prophesying the exact same event in Jeremiah 4, 13 that Ezekiel is prophesying in Ezekiel the first chapter. These are two different prophets. Jeremiah... Ezekiel prophesying the exact same events. All through Jeremiah's prophecies, he's prophesying that. Ezekiel is prophesying this is going to happen uh, 12, 11 years before it happens. So Jeremiah 4, when Jeremiah 4, uh, there in verse 13 says, he saw whirlwinds come in as, and he said they were chariots. Well, if Ezekiel is prophesying the same event, then the whirlwinds of Jeremiah are going, to be whirl, are going to be the chariots here, aren't they? You understand what I'm saying? Look at that one more time. Just look at, my, look at Jeremiah 4.13. Jeremiah is prophesying all the way up to 586 B.C. until they collapse. Jeremiah 4 and verse 13. I've said this before. We all understand from my Sunday morning lessons that Jeremiah, when he prophesied, he was prophesying walking through the streets of Jerusalem for 40 years prophesying the total destruction of Jerusalem, wasn't he? And when did it happen? 586 B.C. That's what Ezekiel's prophesying in the first chapter of Ezekiel. So they're prophesying the same thing, aren't they? And when you look here in Jeremiah 4.13, here he is, prophesying the exact same thing that Ezekiel's prophesying. The point I'm trying to get over to you. If Jeremiah and Ezekiel are prophesying the same thing, then if you've got whirlwinds identified in Jeremiah 4, they're going to be the same whirlwinds as Ezekiel sees over here, aren't they? 
Isn't that right? That's what I'm trying to get you to see. They're prophesying the exact same event. And listen to what Jeremiah calls the whirlwinds. Behold, verse 13, he shall come up as clouds and his chariot, speaking of Nebuchadnezzar, shall be as a whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe unto us, for we are spoiled and carried away. So when he says in Ezekiel 1 and 4, I looked and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north. Where did they attack from? They attacked from the north because they couldn't come across the desert. This is obvious. These are the war chariots of Babylon coming down to destroy Israel. And they had those wheels in a wheel. That's what they had. They were wheels inside of a wheel with those six-spoked wheels. That judgment, there's the eye of God. These seven are the eyes of the Lord. The seven candlesticks. Can you see that? Y'all understand what I'm saying? They knew that was judgment when it came. And there's no doubt in my mind, it was those war chariots. Dad, gummit. Not a UFO, no. I'm just really wanting to say this plain and clear. Well, what you've got, of course, you've got these four faced beasts. Verse 10 For the likeness of these four beasts. They four had the face of a man, the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side, and they four also had the face of an eagle. Where you find that, you find the covenant of God. The covenant of God, the wheel and the wheel, destroys the enemy and protects the righteous in the pupil of God's eye. What do you think those wheels did? Did that destroy the unrighteous man? When they came in, just run over those people, and those scythes were, were, were out. Isn't that amazing? They took scythes that they took out of a field to cut down wheat, and, and, and Israel was called a barley loaf. They were called barley, and the church is called bread. And you had to have those scythes to refine. You started the refining process of barley and wheat with those scythes that were on the side of that. They come in there and they cut Israel down, killing the unrighteous, and the righteous are spared, aren't they? And you got the wheel in the wheel. You have to understand something, too. These are visions that Ezekiel is being shown by God. Now, it doesn't mean because they're visions that they're all going to be exactly in sequence. When you, I want you to see something. You find the wheel in the wheel. I believe they're Assyrian chariots. You find it over here in verse 16. The appearance of the wheels. And their work was like unto the color of beryl. And they four had one likeness. And their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. You find those wheels again in verse 18. As for their rings, the word means rims. As for the rings, they were so high that they were dreadful and their rings were full of eyes round about them. I love that. Their rings were full of wisdom. Full of eyes means full of wisdom. When they get through refining Israel, Israel is going to get wisdom. Who's going to teach Israel knowledge? Isaiah 28 says, <clears throat> this is what's going to bring wisdom to Israel. And then you see here, and here's the thing. You see here in verse 28 of that same chapter, as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, wherever you find these four-faced beasts, you're going to have the bow somewhere nearby because the bow protects God's people, destroys his enemies, and is a sign of his covenant, and the covenant was made with these four creatures. And then he he goes back and tells you in the next chapter, this is a different vision, but he's telling Ezekiel why he's going to destroy him as he's doing in the first chapter 
Because he says in verse 3, He said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me. Even unto this day they are impudent children, stiff-hearted. I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, and they, whether they will hear, whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall they know that there hath been a prophet among them. And then he goes on down through here and he talks about how they wouldn't hearken unto God in that third chapter. And then, he, and then we see the down there in verse 13 of chapter 3, I heard also the noise of the wings of the living creatures that touch one another and the noise of the wheels over against them and a noise of a great rushing. And then we get on over here, and you can actually read through this. And when you go to chapter 4, when you go to chapter 4, he begins to portray in a one-act play. You remember their covenants? They would, you remember their covenants? They would have a little, they would act out something out in public. When Jesus took the cup and he blessed it and said, Take, eat, this is my body. This is the new covenant in my blood. And what they would do, they would perform it. When he said, This is my body, the bread is the body, the body's the church. He was performing a little one act play. You remember in Jeremiah, the, the uh, in fact, look at it, hold your place here and go to Jeremiah, the 51st chapter. And he talks about, in that 51st chapter, uh, Jeremiah takes a, uh, Jeremiah wrote in the book in verse 60, all the evil that should come upon Babylon, in all, even all these words that are written against Babylon. And Jeremiah said to Sarai, when I comest to Babylon and shalt see and shall read all these words, then shalt thou say, O Lord, thou hast spoken against this place to cut it off. He's talking about the destruction of Babylon, and he's going to perform a little one-act play here. To cut it off, that none shall remain in it, neither man nor beast, but that it shall be desolate forever, and it shall be when thou hast made an end of reading this book, that thou shalt bind a stone to it, to the book, and cast it into the midst of the Euphrates. Why? Because he's saying, this is a testimony. Here's the little one-act play in the covenant that God's going to do to Babylon. And thou shalt say, thus shall Babylon sink. The same way I've tied this stone to this book and thrown it into the Euphrates, the same way Babylon will sink, and shall not rise from the evil that I will bring upon her, and they shall be weary thus far are the words of Jeremiah. Now let's go back to that fourth chapter of Ezekiel. And watch, watch Ezekiel. Ezekiel is fixing to perform a covenant before in the eyes of the people. And he's saying, this is what God's going to do. Thou also, son of man, take thee a tile. Some kind of piece of stone or something that's been used for a brick to lay some wall with or something. And lay it before thee and portray upon it. Chakak. C-H-A-Q-A-Q. C-H-A-Q-A-Q. That means in act. He says, I want you to perform this little one act here. If you'll notice, this goes with chapter 1. He tells you. He has a vision, seeing the chariots come down. Chapter 2 talks about them being stiff-hearted and impudent. Chapter 3, he talks about Israel not hearkening. Judah doesn't hearken. Chapter 4, he says, here's what God's going to do to those that are unrepentant. And he says, portray upon this tile the city, even Jerusalem. What is he going to destroy with these chariots when they come in? Jerusalem. We're talking about that on Sunday morning. We're talking about that in the 70 weeks of Daniel. It's Jerusalem that's going to be destroyed. And lay siege against it. And build a fort against it. And cast a mount against it. 
I want you to do this like a little kid playing in the dirt. Set that piece of tile up. Set this up to look like Jerusalem. Lay a siege against the wall. And Jeremiah is just like little kids. He's saying, and this is the wall. And here's, and we're going to throw these rocks. And this is the little soldiers. And just like, just like the little kids playing with toy soldiers. And he's saying, here's what God's going to do to you. And that held up in their courts of law. And God says, this holds up in my higher courts. This is what I'm going to do. So what he's portraying in chapter 4 is what he's going to do that Ezekiel sees the vision in chapter 1. Let me show you. <coughs> and lay a siege against... Now, this is Ezekiel taking a tile, a piece of a tile, and you think, what's he doing out here playing like a little kid? Remember, that's the way they perform their covenants and their contracts. And cast a mount against it, and set the camp also against it, and set battering rams against it, round about. I don't know if he took something about the side, a little stick, and he's acting it out. Moreover, take thou unto thee an iron pan, Ezekiel, and set it for a wall of iron between thee and the city. Here's a tile. And Ezekiel's going to be laying down here on the ground. And he's got a pan of some kind between him and the tile. And it looks like a little kid playing in the dirt. But he's performing a contract. And he's performing the contract of these chariots coming down in the first chapter. And set thy face against it, and it shall be besieged, and thou shalt lay siege against it. This shall be a sign to the house of Israel. Lie thou also upon thy left side. Get out. He's telling him, you lay down here like this. And you got these tiles up here, and the people around you go, what in the world is he doing laying down there? And you got the tiles, and lay down on your left side. It doesn't look like any great production. It doesn't look like Hollywood. It's not supposed to. They're just looking, what's he doing? Oh, I'm laying down here. Looks like I'm playing with toys. It's going to be your destruction. Lie thou upon thy left side and lay thy, the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. Not southern Judah. But Israel, according to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear the iniquity of northern Israel. There was 390 years from the revolt of the ten tribes to the destruction of Jerusalem. 390 years when the ten northern tribes revolted under Jeroboam. From Jeroboam, when they revolted against Judah until the destruction of Jerusalem was 390 years. So what does he do? He lays down on his left side, For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity according to the number of days, 390 days lay on your left side. I don't know whether he got up every day and went out there and laid down or he just stayed there. I know he had to get up and go eat and do natural things. So shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of northern Israel. And when thou hast accomplished them, the days for northern Israel, he's performing a contract. Lie again on thy right side. And thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. For, I, I, like, I believe like some of the writers say, the forty years were included in the sum of the 390 years. And the amount of years that Jeremiah prophesied at, at the very end of Israel was forty years. And that's included in the 390 years. Because from the time of Jeroboam to the destruction of Jerusalem was 390 years. And the, and the 40 years that Jeremiah had prophesied against Jerusalem is depicted here. And he says 40 days. This, was, this 40 years was from the third year 
of Josiah to the sacking of the city. That was 40 years. Therefore, thou... Oh, he says, uh, The iniquity of the house of Judah, 40 days, I have appointed thee each day for a year. Therefore, thou shalt set thy face towards the siege of Jerusalem. And that's what the first chapter is talking about. It's a vision he sees about the destruction by the war chariots of Babylon. And thine arm shall be uncovered, and thou shalt prophesy against it. And he's laying down there on the ground prophesying against this piece of tile. You say, boy, is that God God childish? No. God just don't do things with a great big production. I like it when, you, when he has an enemy, when he's got an enemy like Ahab or, and, or Athaliah. And he didn't make a a lot of big noise and big production. God didn't do that. He'd say, kill her, and they kill her, and she's dead. Let's go. Let's go do something else. Said, boom, boom, it's over. When God killed him, he didn't make a production about it. It wasn't big. It was just the end. Therefore shalt thou set thy face toward the siege of Jerusalem, and thine arm shall be uncovered, and thou shalt prophesy against it. And behold, I will lay bands upon thee, and thou shalt not turn thee from one side to another till thou hast ended the days of thy siege. And then you get on over into the fifth chapter, and it gives another contract. That's what these verses are about. Start in verse 1. Thou son of man, take thee a sharp knife, take thee a barber's razor, and cause it to pass upon thine head and upon thy beard. Then take thee balances to weigh and divide the hair. Weigh the hair out. Thou shalt burn with fire a third part of the hair in the midst of the city. I don't know if he's talking about in the midst of the pieces of tiles on the ground or the literal city. When the days of the siege are fulfilled, and thou shalt take a third part and smite about it with a knife, and a third part shalt thou scatter in the wind. And Babylon was called an east wind, and they were said to scatter Israel or scatter Judah, and I will draw out a sword after them. Thou shalt also take therefore a few in number and bind them in thy skirts. Then take of them again and cast them in the midst of the fire and burn them in the fire, for thereof shall a fire come forth into the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord God, this is Jerusalem. What, I just, what you just acted out is Jerusalem. You're not going to understand this unless you understand contracts, are you? But he gives him a vision in the first chapter about those, about those Babylonian chariots coming in. And then he starts giving, showing, he says, Jeremiah, what we want to do is, I want to sign a contract with Jerusalem. They've already signed on the bottom line with their blood. And I'm going to destroy them. And I want you to portray the contract out in front of them. This is Jerusalem. I've set it in the midst of the nations and countries that are round about her. And she hath changed my judgments into wickedness more than the nations and my statutes more than the countries that are round about her. For they have refused my judgments and my statutes. They have not walked in them. Talking about Jerusalem and Judah. The first chapter is talking about. And what he does he sets up in the first chapter what he's going to do by giving Ezekiel the vision, and then he goes back and reviews this. People say, Jim, you reviewed too much. <laughs> then he goes back and reviews what he's going to do to them. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because, because ye multiplied more than the nations that are round about you and have not walked in my statutes, neither have kept my judgments, neither have done according to the... To the judgments of the nations that are round about you. Therefore thus saith the Lord God. Behold I even I am against thee. And will. I put a circle around will. I will execute judgments in the midst of thee. And in the sight of the nations. And I will do in thee. That which I have not done. When I bring this destruction. Of Nebuchadnezzar down. And cause him to murder and pillage and rape. And that's me that's doing it. There's the sovereignty of God. And whereunto 
I will not do any more of the like because of all thine abominations. Therefore, the fathers shall eat the sons in the midst of thee, and the sons shall eat their fathers. Cannibalism, Kahan Baal, priests of Baal, Christ's mass. The mass is eating human flesh. And I will execute judgments in thee, and the whole remnant of thee will I scatter into all the winds. Wherefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, surely because thou hast defiled my sanctuary with all the detestable things, with all thine abominations, therefore will I diminish thee. Neither shall mine eye spare. Neither shall my wheels in a wheel spare. Neither shall my rainbow spare. Neither shall my war bow spare. And they'll be on the sides of these chariot wheels that will be the bow of God when they see him coming in. That's God's bow. It's not a bit, that's not Nebuchadnezzar's bow. It's God's bow. Nebuchadnezzar is just an instrument. He is a servant in the hand of God, isn't he? Neither will I have any pity. And the third part of thee shall die with the pestilence, with the famine. There's the judgments of God, isn't it? Shall, and shall be consumed in the midst of thee. And the third Part shall fall by the sword. There he's got sword, famine, pestilence, don't you? Round about thee, and I will scatter. Scatter is by the Babylonians. There's the beast. You got the, you got the sword, famine, pestilence, beast right here, don't you? Huh? You got pestilence, famine, sword, and scatter means the beast. There's the four judgments right there. In verse 2, you can, you can see them in verse 2 also. Yeah. Thou shalt burn with fire a third part in the midst of the city. Yeah. Yeah, the fire. Yeah. And the sword. You've got it all through here. All you have to do is learn to read it. Yes, it's by God. He said it's by him. Did he say, I will do this? Yeah, that's God doing evil, isn't it? I'll scatter a third part into all the winds. I will draw out a sword after you. Thus shall mine anger be accomplished. But he's going to save certain ones, isn't he? Whenever you find the four beasts, he's, he's got to have his bow. And in the midst of his bow is his iris. I mean, is his pupil, his apple. And we're the apple of his eye. And there's a wall of fire. And what is destroying the rest of, of Israel is saving us. And I will cause my fury to rest upon them. And I will be comforted. And they shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it in my zeal. When I have accomplished my fury in them... Moreover, I will make thee waste in a reproach among the nations that are round about thee in the sight of all that pass by. So it shall be a reproach and a taunt and instruction and astonishment unto the nations that are round about thee when I shall execute judgments in thee in anger and fury. God's going to get anger and furious in Israel and furious rebukes. I, the Lord, have spoken it. When I shall send upon them the evil arrows... What do you shoot an arrow with? A bow. A bow the eye of God. Well, that's what's coming out of the chariots. That's right. This is allegorical, figurative language. When I send the evil arrows of famine, there's an arrow of God out of his bow, which shall be for their destruction, or should I say out of his eye? His eye is his bow, isn't it? You say, why do you keep repeating it? Because the Bible keeps repeating it. Which shall be for their destruction, which I will send to destroy you, and I will increase the famine upon you, and will break your staff of bread. So will I send upon you famine, evil beast, and they shall bereave thee, and pestilence and blood shall bring through thee, and I will bring the sword upon thee. I, the Lord, have spoken it. The word spoken is the word dabar. It means to arrange I have arranged for Nebuchadnezzar to come down and destroy you. That's my will. So if you'll notice, he gives a vision in the first chapter about what he's going to do. He tells them why in the second and the third chapter because they went after other gods and didn't obey him. And then he has, in the fourth and fifth chapter, he has Ezekiel portray a contract in front of him. Says, you've already signed your part of the contract. Let me sign mine. And it goes on. And he, and he keeps rebuking and reprimanding them. 
I don't have time to read all of it. I'm uh, just looking at something. Oh, look over here in, in chapter 7. Chapter 7. Well, he says in, chapter, in verse 10 of chapter 6, And they shall know that I am the Lord, and that I have not said in vain that I would do this evil unto them. I'll do the evil. God does evil, creates evil, does it wherever he wants to. And it's righteous. And it's righteous. Let's read 11 and 12 of that chapter, that sixth chapter. Thus saith the Lord God, smite with thine hand, stamp with thy foot, and say, Alas, for all the evil abominations of the house of Israel, for they shall fall by the sword, by the famine, by the pestilence. He that is far... I started reading the Bible when I was about 17, and I kept running across sword, famine, pestilence. And then he'd say sword, famine, pestilence, sword, famine, pestilence, sword, famine, pestilence. Then he'd say sword, famine, pestilence, beast. And I kept saying, what is that? I never heard any preacher even comment on it. It's the four judgments of God. In the 14th chapter of Ezekiel, you get into that. He that is afar off shall die of the pestilence. He that is near shall fall by the sword. And God says, if you happen to get away, I'll kill, with, kill you with the pestilence over there in Egypt. You ain't going to get away from God. And he that remaineth and is besieged shall die by the famine. Thus will I accomplish my fury upon them. God said, when he says, when you die by the sword, the famine, the pestilence, that's my fury, Judah, my people. People say, God wouldn't do evil and God wouldn't hurt anybody. He wouldn't make them sick. Well, he'll send pestilence on you. And you can't get away from him. He said, no matter where you go, I'll get you. Whew. Boy, isn't that something? God says, I'm going to get you. You can't get away from me when you rebel against me. Then shall you know that I am the Lord when their slain men shall be among their idols round about their altars upon every high hill and all the tops of the mountains under every green tree. What's a green tree? That's a fir, isn't it? Yeah. They chose a tree there in the 40th chapter of Isaiah that would not rot. Look at chapter 7, verse 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Also thou son of man, thus saith the Lord God, unto the land of Israel, an end. The end is come upon the four corners of the land. Now is the end come upon thee. I will send mine anger upon thee, and will judge thee according to thy ways. This is God judging Judah by the chariot wheels, by the bows of his anger, by his arrows of famine and pestilence and sword, and will recompense upon thee all thine abominations. And mine eye shall not spare. My wheels, my iris shall not spare you. Why do you think he kept saying, mine eye will not spare? The seven candlesticks are the eyes of the Lord, aren't they? We're the apple of his eye, and you're only spared if you're the apple, if you're in the center. Neither will I have pity, but I will recompense thy ways upon thee, and thine abomination shall be in the midst of thee, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, and evil, and only evil, behold, is come, and end is come, the end is come, it watcheth for thee, behold, it come. Look at verse 8. Now will I shortly pour out my fury upon thee, and accomplish mine anger upon thee, Judah, my children. I'm going to refine you and will judge thee according to thy ways and will recompense thee for all thine abominations. And my wheel, my eye, my iris, my bow will not spare, neither will I have pity. Every time you see mine eye will not spare, just put bow out there. Put iris, put rainbow. Put wheel and the wheel will not spare. We'll recompense thee according to thy ways and thine abominations that are in the midst of thee. Ye shall know that I am the Lord that smiteth. People say, God won't kill anybody, won't hurt anybody. God said, I'll smite you, I'll kill you. Well, that don't sound like the God of Kenneth Copeland, does it? (laughs) You know, I want to bow to a God like this. A God that I can understand and control, I don't want to serve him. This one is one I want to serve. No, it ain't. How much time do I have? Ten minutes. 
Let me get over here. Well, look here. Look down here, verse 15. The sword is without and the pestilence and the famine within. He that is in the field shall die with the sword, and he that is in the city, famine and pestilence shall devour him. But they that escape of them shall escape and shall be on the mountains like doves of the valley, and all of them mourning, every one for his iniquity. And God said, if you go to Babylon, Jeremiah kept saying, if you go to Babylon, you won't die. The pupil will go to Babylon and bow to God in Babylon. He said, all you have to do is just, is just submit to Nebuchadnezzar and go. And you're safe. You're in the pupil of his eye. But the obedient ones did that. The others took off running to Egypt. And look back at verse 18. When we see those men standing at the inner court of the, the 25 men with their backs toward the temple and their faces towards the east, and they worship the sun in a sunrise service in verse 16 of chapter 8. And he says in verse 18, Therefore will I, will I also deal in fury. Mine eye shall not spare. My wheel shall not spare. My wheel and a wheel. My bow will not spare. My rainbow will not spare. Neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. Then chapter 9, chapter 9 is those in the pupil. That's the apple of the eye. That's the man with the little ink horn. And he goes around and marks those in the forehead that belong to God. I just got through telling you. When Jeremiah was prophesying, Jeremiah, they had a, they had a covenant with, with the king of Babylon. And at, after Josiah, Josiah dies about 605 at the beginning of the first deportation. Well, Jeremiah's been going through the city and he warns the people do not flee. The only reason I'm carrying you over here to Babylon, you won't leave the land alone. You won't let the land keep its Sabbaths. You have to go over there. Nebuchadnezzar is going to come over here and pick you up and carry you over there. But you'll be okay if you go do what I tell you to do. Go over there. I'm going to let the land set still. Then I'm going to give decrees for you to come back and build a city and the temple. Do not flee to Egypt. If you flee to Egypt, you might escape the sword in Jerusalem. I'll chase you down with the pestilence and I'll kill you there. The ones who are safe are the ones that submit willingly and trudge off to Babylon. They're safe. They're in the pupil of his eye. Verse 16 of where? Chapter 7. But they that escape of them shall escape. Those that escape the previous verse, the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and shall be on the mountains like doves of the valleys, all of them mourning. These are those who are mourning over the sin of Israel. Those who mourn are not going to die. Are they the ones that just stayed in Israel? No. No. The ones who willingly went to Babylon, they'll be safe. And the poor that are left in Israel, they're left after Nebuchadnezzar comes in and makes his great siege. It's up to Nebuchadnezzar how many he wants to carry off to Babylon. But some of them he leaves there because they're poor. Nebuchadnezzar carries off, when you look at the 24th chapter of 2 Kings, he carries off the, 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 uh, the craftsmen. The nobles and the craftsmen, the men who can build, can make weapons. And he leaves the poor there. They'll be saved. The poor, remember Jeremiah was given the, Jeremiah was given the option to go to Babylon and own property and land. Because Nebuchadnezzar had heard that Jeremiah kept warning them that he was coming. And Nebuchadnezzar had every right to go over there and do what he did because he was the, king that was controlling Israel and they had made a peace treaty with him and made a league with him and they were supposed to be uh, one of his vassal nations but they were trying to go over here and double cross Nebuchadnezzar with the Pharaoh of Egypt and, and 
He said, don't you, God told Jeremiah, tell them, do not flee to Egypt. This is my program, my plan. You run off to Egypt, I'll have you chased down, I'll have you killed. You go safely with Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon and you'll be fine. Well, yes, they're mourning over sin. They're either ones that went to Egypt, the ones that God lets... No, they're not the ones that went to Egypt. They're the ones that went to Babylon. You go to Egypt, you die. You die going to Egypt. These are either... The, <clears throat> all hands shall be feeble, all knees shall be weak as water... They shall also gird themselves with sackcloth. Who's girding themselves with sackcloth? Those that are mourning over sin. The ones that are mourning over sin. And horror shall cover them. It's a horrible thing to see this happen. And shame shall be upon their faces and baldness upon their heads. Because they'll shave their heads. The man who was willing to shave his head was mourning over sin. Let me show you who these are. Go over there to the ninth chapter. Go to the ninth chapter. Here's where they are. Uh, look here in, this man is going around with his inkhorn. And the Lord, verse 4, the Lord said unto him, this man with the inkhorn, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry and they're clothing themselves in sackcloth. They're shaving their heads. They're shaving their beards as a disgrace to what Israel has done. And they're crying for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And the ones that have the mark will be spared. Can you see that? Because, Mary, listen to me. Are you paying attention? Listen, Mary, you didn't listen while I read verse 4 of chapter 9. The ones who are mourning and crying and weeping over Israel. These people are not, the believers don't mean, hey, we're getting saved, we're happy. They're watching their nation destroyed. Are they, are they the ones that stayed in Jerusalem? Mary, listen to me. Listen. Nebuchadnezzar comes in. He can either leave some in Jerusalem or take them back to Babylon. The ones that are in Jerusalem are submitting to him. But there's no need in carrying all of these poor over there. So he takes these real important dignitaries, all their craftsmen who can build swords. And Nebuchadnezzar, by his own will, leaves a lot of the poor there. It is the poor in Jerusalem, but it's also those who willingly go to Babylon. Of their own volition, they say, I'm willing to submit. Those who run for their lives, Zedekiah took off running to Egypt. He was chased down, brought back. His children were killed before his very eyes, and he was blinded. He told them, go to Babylon, sit down, build houses, plant vineyards, plant gardens. You're going to be there 70 years. That's okay. You're not going to be destroyed. You're not going to be hurt there if Nebuchadnezzar decides to leave some. But the ones who were mourning, just because it says they were spared, it doesn't mean they weren't mourning. The ones running for their lives weren't mourning, were they? They weren't mourning over sin. Jeremiah said, go to Babylon. Everything will be okay with you if you go to Babylon. When Nebuchadnezzar came over here, he carried the, the important ones to Babylon and the other poor he left there. But the ones that he left here were just as safe as the ones in Babylon. And the ones in Babylon were just as safe as the ones here. They were all in the pupil of God's eye. The ones that were mourning over sin. That's why he's talking about that in that fourth verse of the ninth chapter. He said, go mark the ones that are mourning for these abominations. He says the same things back there in verse 16 of chapter 7. He says... Uh, but they that escape of them shall escape and shall be on the mountains like doves of the valleys. All of them mourning, every one for his iniquity. All hands shall be feeble, all knees shall be weak as water. And they shall gird themselves with sackcloth because of the horror they're seeing. 
In fact, when you read the book of Lamentations, when they get to Babylon, they're weeping, they're just weary, they're dreary. Everything is destroyed over here in in Jerusalem. They have no city, they have no God, they have no temple. Even the believers are depressed out of their minds. Can you see that? They're depressed. And the ones he says kill, if you'll notice in chapter 9, he says, the ones I want you to start with, verse 5, and to the others he said in mine hearing, go ye after him through the city and smite, and let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. And he says, slay utterly old young, both maids and little children and women, except for those that have the mark, those that are mourning over sin. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark. And look at this. And begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. That's a reference back to verse 16 of chapter 8. Because these are the... He said, where I want you to begin, I want you to begin with these 25 men with their backs toward the temple in verse 16 of chapter 8 that are facing the sun, having a sunrise service, worshiping the sun. Start with them, kill them first. But the ones who are mourning over the sin of Israel, save them. If they're in sackcloth, you only put on sackcloth because you were mourning over sin. So the ones in sackcloth are saved. The ones with the mark of God on their head, that means they had in their minds repentance. Can you see that, Mary? Huh? No, not I guess. The ones who... There were two sets of people that were saved. The ones that Nebuchadnezzar decided to leave in Jerusalem and the ones he carried over here. The ones he carried over here were safe. They were mourning over sin. The rest were trying to run for their lives. Those are the ones that God killed and received the judgment of his bow. And that chapter 9, he's showing the ones that he's saving. Because he's putting a mark on their foreheads and they're mourning over sin. You have to be mourning over sin to be in the pupil of God's eye, don't you? To be the light of his eye, you have to be mourning. I've run out of time. You've got to look at everything in this proper perspective the way it sits. And this chapter 9 is a sister chapter to chapter 7 of Revelation. I keep trying to work there, but I wanted to cover some of these first chapters. And all he's doing is he is getting visions, particularly that first chapter of what he's, he's setting up, a vision of how he's declaring it to be done through those first chapters. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. I'll come back to chapter 10 next week. I hope I can get to it. Do y'all realize you can just go through do y'all realize you can go through the book of Ezekiel and read all these verses and it'll be God repeating over and over the judgment that's going to come upon Judah all through the book. Through the whole book. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and for truth. Help us to understand this book that you've laid out before us. Thank you for giving us such magnificent picture of your judgment. Thank you for giving us an understanding that men can't even begin to grasp. Lord, this is such a difficult book without eyes to see and ears to hear. But the Lord, the fact you have revealed it to us, this is a comfort to us because it makes us to know that we belong to you if we can even see any part of it. Because you keep the eyes of evil men that do not mourn over sin, you keep them blind. They can't see or hear. Thank you for truth. Cause us to continue this work, and we'll give you praise in Christ's name. Amen.